Welcome to the U.S. Foreign Policy Series at the <laughs> Institute for International Studies here at UC Berkeley. Um, my name is Neil Jock. I'm the co-host of this series along with my colleague, Daniel Sargent, from the Department of History. Um, the series is um, focused on people who have been engaged in government and bringing their thoughts on how government works to us on U.S. foreign policy, as well as bringing senior, well-respected diplomatic historians to talk about U.S. foreign policy issues. Just for your information, we have a couple of more events in the series coming up. On Monday, Dr. Gregory Treverton, the current chairman of the National Intelligence Council, will be here to speak here in this room at 4 o'clock. It kind of bookends the way this program began. We have posters around of the previous uh, uh, speakers. And this series began with the poster in the corner where Greg Treverton's predecessor, Chris Kojum, was the first speaker in the series. Uh, when Greg speaks, it's not the end of the series, but it is a, <laughs> its own bookend. And after Greg, we have Dr. Uh, Odd Arne Wested, who will be talking about um, uh, Restless Empire, China, and the World. So I encourage you to consider those as well. Um, I also want to just note a companion series to this hosted by my colleague Harold Smith downstairs at the Institute of Governmental Studies, uh, focused on defense issues. Uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Joseph Joffe from Die Zeit in uh, Germany will be speaking on the end of the end of history, the return of power politics, and that will be downstairs on April 21st in the Institute of Governmental Studies Library, room 109, so I encourage you to consider that as well. Um, let me just say, after Dr. Shockey's presentation today on American foreign policy in a time of retrenchment, we'll have Q&A, but then follow it with a, a brief um, uh, uh, reception when you can talk to her a little bit more directly and talk among yourselves. So to introduce Corey, despite working as a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution and having also completed an undergraduate degree at Stanford University, it's a real pleasure to welcome her to Berkeley. <laughs> Corey and I go back together to the National Security Council where we worked together and became, got to know each other and respect each other's work. So um, the, the Stanford slur is uh, not really heartfelt. In addition to her undergraduate degree from Stanford, she obtained a PhD and MA in government from the University of Maryland. She also holds an additional MA from the School of Public Affairs at Maryland, <coughs> University of Maryland. After completing her PhD, uh, Corey's first government job was in the Pentagon as NATO desk officer in the Strategic Plans and Policy Division, J5, from 1990 to 1994, where she worked on military issues of German unification, NATO after the Cold War, and alliance expansion. Very interesting time to be there, of course. She moved on within the Pentagon to the office of the Secretary of Defense, where from 1994 to 1996, she served as the Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Strategy and Requirements. During President George W. Bush's first term, she was the Director for Defense Strategy and Requirements on the National Security Council. She was responsible for interagency coordination for long-term defense planning and coalition maintenance issues. Some of the projects she contributed to included conceptualizing and budgeting for continued transformation of defense practices, realignment of US military forces and bases around the world, creating NATO's allied command transformation and the NATO response force, and recruiting and retaining coalition partners for operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. And given the time she worked there, you can imagine the, that she was a very busy uh, civil servant. Um, <laughs> Dr. Shockey was the Deputy Director for Policy Planning in the United States uh, State Department after leaving the National Security Council from December 20, 2007 to May 2008. She left the State Department to serve as Senior Policy Advisor to the McCain-Palin 2008 presidential campaign, where she was responsible for policy development and outreach in the areas of foreign and defense policy. Earlier in the 2008 campaign, she had been an advisor to Rudy Giuliani. She has, been the, she has held the Distinguished Chair of International Security Studies at West Point. She has served on the faculties of the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, the University of Maryland School of Public Affairs, and the National Defense University. Her most recent publications at Hoover include State of Disrepair, Fixing the Culture and Practices of the State Department, and Managing American Hegemony, Essays on Power in a Time of Dominance. In addition to publishing academic articles and editorials, she blogs for Foreign Policy's Shadow Government and serves on the boards of the journal Orbis and the Center for European Reform. So with that said, please join me now in welcoming Dr. Corey Shockey to Berkeley. Uh, 
Uh, so given what Neil said about my former jobs, I just want to say at the start, um, lots of good reasons to think I was bad at my jobs, right? Um, but I want to be graded like Olympic divers. I want a degree of difficulty factored into my score because keeping countries that had troops in Iraq and Afghanistan in Iraq and Afghanistan and trying to keep the McCain-Palin campaign from running off the rails it were no small feats on either of them. And I would have happily traded those jobs um, into anybody else who would have preferred to do them rather than have me do them most days. Um, the continuous kind of when, when I look at my career, what I think I see is a long time fixation on the question of what makes the United States stronger than other powers in the international order, right? Because it's not obvious. There are countries equally large. There are countries equally diverse. There are countries, like there are lots of commonalities and yet American dominance of the international order looks to me more likely to be sustained at least through our lifetimes and beyond than any of the alternatives. Um, so that's our subject for today on American foreign policy because we are in a time of retrenchment, right? Um, which is pretty natural. Uh, I just finished writing a book on, uh, on the transition from British to American dominance in the international order. It's a history that starts in 1823 and ends in 1923. And I have two uh, things to report from that. The first is that right, this pendular swing from an activist America to a retrenchment America in foreign policy is perfectly routine and perfectly normal, especially in a system where the political leadership is tied so closely by election term to public attitudes. The second thing, particularly in this presidential political cycle, let me just say that it's mildly reassuring to me that we are not newly a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. The United States, for most of its history, is a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. <laughs> this is not news. And you can take great faith in the strength of checks and balances in the American political system. Um, on the foreign policy beat, though, um, we are in a period of retrenchment, which is, I think, quite natural after the way the Bush administration had taken such an activist role in the international order. Not just the Iraq war, although I imagine uh, that for many people is the zenith of it, but for example, in responding to the 9-11 attacks, to have responded to them with a strategy in Afghanistan that didn't just um, target people who had committed the attacks, but sought to create a global war on terror to try and make terrorism as, um, as uh, reprehensible an action in the international order as slavery or piracy in generations earlier that chose to try and make Afghanistan, to take Afghanistan from a country that was 185th on the UN Human Development Index, 185th out of 187 countries in 2001, and create a functioning, accountable government in that country. Um, to a vision of NATO expansion that would pull into the Western uh, military institutions and to encourage the EU to pull into the Western European political institutions, countries uh, that had little experience of the kind of intensive uh, scrutiny, transparency, and good governance that marks the countries of Western Europe. Um, so, uh, so it's natural, uh, even if it hadn't been as costly as the Bush administration's uh, policies were costly to the country, it's perfectly natural that you would see uh, the next president run on a campaign of doing less in the world. And to President Obama's great credit, right, the foreign policy he ran on is the foreign policy he has executed as president. 
I'm personally not that favorable towards it, but I think it's a wonderful thing when people run for high office and actually do what they promised the voters that they would do. And President Obama's um, campaign strategy in 2008 was that the Iraq war had been a major mistake and we needed to wind it down as quickly as possible, that the war in Afghanistan uh, merited seeing through, uh, and that the United States needed to be a lot less sharp-edged in the world, a lot more multilateral, uh, a lot more uh, cooperative, a lot less focused on things we were worried about and focused on big systemic challenges like nonproliferation and global warming. And uh, in conjunction, sort of running a little cross purposes to that was President Obama's objection to free trade agreements. You recall in 2008 he thought NAFTA needed to be renegotiated. And so the free trade agreement with Korea and other countries uh, slowed way down in terms of the president's priorities. And uh, I think he has come in the last several years um, to, to believe that those policies have been vindicated, right? Any of you read uh, the interviews that Jeffrey Goldberg did with President Obama in the Atlantic magazine? They're quite extraordinary. I can't think of a time a sitting American president uh, actually gave that much honest insight into how he thought about the challenges of American foreign policy. For those of you who didn't read it, uh, what President Obama said is that uh, you know, the United States is, is exasperated with our allies doing too little. He called out the government of Saudi Arabia, uh, the Western European governments, uh, and several others as being free riders on the United States, countries that didn't do enough for themselves. And this has been one real consistent theme in President Obama's foreign policy, which is that we should not care more about other people's security than they care about it, right? So if Afghanistan can't raise an army to police the country, then Afghanistan deserves to be a mess. Um, if Western Europe can't mobilize itself to spend more than 1.5% of its uh, GDP on defense policy, then it's actually more their problem than our problem that Russia is aggressive on the boundaries of Europe. That if um, Iraq cannot make the kinds of political compromises that would allow Sunni, Shia, and Kurdish groups to share power in the government, then Iran doesn't deserve, excuse me, then Iraq doesn't deserve our help with their problems. That's been a consistent theme in his foreign policy, and you hear it really clearly ringing through the Atlantic interviews. Um, in fact, in a weird way, President Obama actually has that in common with Donald Trump, um, right? Like, it is the same argument that both of them make. Um, and where that has taken President Obama is to what one of his, uh, Ben Rhodes, uh, his deputy national security advisor, described the strategy as leading from behind. And it sounds stupid when it's said that way, but I actually share the president's basic belief that over the space of about the last 60 years, the United States has allowed to accrue to us more and more responsibility for other people's security in a way that has allowed other countries to rest against us and not do as much as they should on their own. Where I differ with the president, so, so one last point about that, right? Um, there have seldom been American presidents more inherently um, uh, engaged in the world than Dwight Eisenhower, right? The war-winning commander from Europe who becomes American president in 1952. He had argued, had testified before the Congress when they were deciding whether to put U.S. troops in Europe 
as part of the NATO alliance's defense guarantee. And Eisenhower tipped the scales of congressional votes in 1951 by arguing that the United States should have troops in Europe until the Europeans got strong enough and rich enough once again to bear this burden by their own. So, so Eisenhower would actually be turning over in his grave to realize that, what, 70 years um, after the end of World War II, at a time when Europeans are every bit as wealthy as Americans are, could raise military forces every bit as strong as ours, they just aren't. Eisenhower would find that genuinely shocking. So I do not by any means uh, want to validate Donald Trump's reckless and dangerous um, pronouncements. I'm one of the foreign policy people who signed the letter saying we oppose him and wouldn't work for him and believe he's a danger to the country. But there is a continuum between Eisenhower's policy of saying, yes, we need to help states while they get on their feet and until they can take responsibility for own security. The migration of more and more responsibilities to the United States, um, President Obama saying, we need to step back from this and lead from behind. Right? We need to let Britain and France take the lead on the Libya operation. And the end of the continuum is Donald Trump's you know, suggesting that Japan and South Korea should have nuclear weapons of their own and not, be, not make any of that our problem. Um, I think the president is basically right that we have allowed to accrue too much responsibility to ourselves. But where he is wrong is in his approach to getting others to do more, right? So if you take the Iraq example, where this is a country coming out of 40 years of authoritarian government, a vicious, an invasion by us, and a vicious civil war, at first as we occupy the country poorly, and then when we pull out of the country. In both instances, you see the spooling up of sectarian violence in the country the influence of the Iranians. Um, and President Obama's approach was that we need to threaten the Iraqis that we won't, that unless they solve this problem, we're not going to help them. But my, my reading of history, as well as my experience working coalition operations, is that he has that exactly wrong. Right? People don't make brave choices when you threaten them with abandonment. People make brave choices when you set them up to be successful. And let me give you my favorite example of what leading from behind looks like when you do it well. And it's from the Clinton administration. Uh, if you remember uh, the intervention in Somalia, right? After the American soldiers were killed and we pulled out of Somalia, and President Clinton, I think quite shamefully, blamed that debacle on the United Nations, when in fact the reasons it, it turned out badly were almost entirely domestic American reasons, the president being unwilling to, to uh, straighten out the lines of authority and straighten out the mission. But President Clinton said, we're not going to commit troops under the United Nations anymore. They can't get this right. So it's obvious we were not going to, the Congress and of course the Congress, always less temperate than the executive branch of government. Congress got all spooled up and uh, would, would have legislated it. You'll recall they zeroed out funding for the United Nations for a while. Um, and uh, so, but then something marvelous happened, which is the people of East Timor had an opportunity to take their independence from Indonesia. Um, and uh, the government of Indonesia was sorely tempted to send its military in to prevent this. The Clinton administration so wonderfully understood that opportunities for positive change are fleeting, right? They don't stay on the table if you don't take them. Situations get worse or better depending on uh, what happens in the moment. And they knew that we couldn't be part of a UN force to help keep the Indonesians out and stabilize the transition for the people of Aceh. 
The Australians, however, were willing to. And the Clinton administration quietly underwrote Australia's success. We offered them any military assistance it would take for them to be willing to do this, to fill any gaps they had in their operations, to work all of the processes of approval and funding and support in the United Nations. And you'll realize you never heard about this because that's what leading from behind properly does. It doesn't take the credit when other people take the risk. And contrast that with the Libya intervention, which was the Obama administration choice um, to, to showcase their strategy of leading from behind, right? We were unwilling to get involved uh, until the point where Muammar Gaddafi was threatening a bloodbath in Benghazi. And when we did, we, uh, we had the British and French take the mainstay of responsibility. Again, that's all well and good so far. But it's typically not a great form of leadership to have then the US NATO commander uh, Admiral Stavridis and the US NATO ambassador, Evo Dalder, write an op-ed piece in the New York Times talking about how none of this would have been possible without the United States doing 80% of the work. Moreover, all the hard, complicated, difficult military stuff was all us, right? If you're the French or the British, how, how enthusiastic are you gonna be about stepping forward to take the majority of the risk if we take the kind of credit that way. And that's even before getting to the disgraceful lack of stabilization, planning, and involvement on the part of the United States and the other countries that helped overthrow the, the government of Muammar Gaddafi, right? Libya is a dangerous country, most importantly for the people of Libya right now. And we bear some culpability for that because of our intervention. Um, so, uh, so there are ways to lead from behind well. I think the Obama administration doesn't do it particularly well. The Libya example is one example. The other um, example I would give you is Syria, um, which is such a heartbreaking tragedy because um, there, President Obama, again, if you read the Atlantic article, President Obama talks about Syria as though everybody's a bad guy, right? There, there's absolutely nothing we can do to prevent, could have done or could do now to prevent the, the country of Syria from descending into a bloodbath that has now killed a half a million people. And 90% of the Syrians dead in the war in Syria have been killed by the government, which is targeting hospitals, which is dropping barrel bombs in civilian areas. Right? Take yourself back to, to the spring, that hopeful spring when Syrian people began peacefully protesting a, the, an authoritarian government. That would have been a great moment to, along with other countries, foster positive change. Right? to put the government on notice that uh, governments that use violence against their own population uh, when, when the population is seeking peaceful political change, that that's a delegitimizing choice. Even once the violence starts, um, let me just give you an example of an intervention uh, in a civil war that, that protected civilians and worked extraordinarily well. And that's the American intervention in the Kurdish areas of Iraq after the 1991 war, right? Where you'll recall uh, Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons that he had used on Iraqi citizens in the Kurdish north and killed about 10,000 people. Um, they had supported the American intervention. Again, this is the 91 war, when we came into the country. And so we're very much at risk. And Saddam Hussein was making, uh, was making overtures of the kind of, uh, same kinds of threats that Muammar Gaddafi made in Libya, Saddam Hussein made about the Kurdish areas in northern Iraq. 
And the United States, in conjunction with a number of other countries, passed a UN Security Council resolution uh, offering humanitarian support and protection to, so we identified a zone, a safe zone, let's call it, um, in which we committed to protect people who were there as refugees. We understood this was not going to be a temporary move. This was kind of, so we didn't have people living in tents. You built homes for people because this was going to be at least semi-permanent. Um, and the American military got all of the humanitarian assistance organized and then stepped back and supported NGOs and humanitarian uh, organizations. And, you, and we committed to do it basically open-endedly. Over the course of 15 years, you grew a leadership from the people in that part of the country who are now Iraq's main success story. Right? Everybody's talking about how the Kurds are the only part of Iraq that's properly governed and is That's not magic. It's not ethnicity. It's not religion. It's attentive standing by people who are trying to do hard things in dangerous circumstances and helping make them successful. When American foreign policy succeeds, it succeeds because we work with with local forces and setting them up to be successful and letting them have the credit of having taken the biggest risks. So um, in conclusion, <laughs> OK, since I have a couple minutes, I will maybe make uh, one more point about, about the flaw in President Obama's approach to leading from behind, which is that it translates very poorly into the realm of military force. Right? Uh, and here again, Syria is the example, right? Because uh, pr the president and Secretary Kerry are both quite fond of saying that there's no military solution to this problem, which is true as far as it goes. But unless you are going to exterminate entire populations, there's never a military solution to problems, right? The use of military force changes an adversary's belief that they either can or want to continue to fight. And the reason you use decisive force, why you don't escalate in small little increments of 300 advisors here and a specialized targeting team there and uh, you know, we now have 5,000 American troops in Iraq and Syria. How many people knew that? Right? That's only a few thousand shy of what the American military wanted to leave in Iraq in 2011 when the situation was stabilized to hold a stable situation in place. 5,000 troops, 300 here, 400 there is a terrible way to fight a war because it gives your enemy time to react and find new strategies. And by doing things in small increments, what you convey are your own hesitation and the limits of your own commitment to solve a problem. That actually encourages your adversaries to keep fighting. And that's, I think, what we are seeing in Syria right now. Uh, since you are sure to ask me what I think we should do in Syria right now, <laughs> I will um, put on the table the uh, northern Iraq example from 1991. I think we should do that actually in the zones along the Jordanian and Turkish borders to first uh, convince Syrians that there is a safe place in their own country so they don't need to flee the country which would take the pressure off European countries, and also take, more importantly for me, take the pressure off of Jordan and Turkey. Jordan is tottering under the weight of the generosity they have shown to Syrian refugees. Turkey is reacting. It, it's exacerbating a very bad political trend in Turkey towards more erratic authoritarianism, uh, by the president of Turkey. 
the, these, we are not in a stable situation that where time is our ally. And President Obama's strategy requires a long period of time to be successful. And I would suggest to you that we don't have the kind of time that his uh, strategy suggests. Uh, when President Obama started on this path, there were 250,000 dead Syrians. There are now 500,000 dead Syrians. The governments of Turkey and Jordan are tottering under the weight. Europe is forever changed now because of the immigration crisis from last year. It's changed in the near term because you see the rise of right-wing politics, or not the right, the rise has a different cause, but you see momentum given to right-wing politics in Europe as a result of it. Moreover, these are societies that struggle to get the kind of inclusive diversity that for all of our difficulties as Americans, we're pretty good at. Um, the United States doesn't have a, a, a program to, to mainstream immigrants beyond our labor force. But, but the labor force turns out to be a pretty good way for immigrants to feel like they are part of the mainstream of society. This is going to be a huge struggle for the countries of Europe across the next 25 years. And I will conclude by saying that as with the refugee crisis, in general with the United States retrenching, the world becomes a little more frayed, a little more dangerous, a little more uncertain. The good news for Americans is that we have the widest margin of error, right? We are going to be some of the last countries affected by the, the fraying of the international order that has occurred in the last several years because of our retrenchment. But it, it actually matters to us that others are affected by it, both directly, namely, we're the most globalized of countries. People travel in and out of our country. Our businesses are all operating overseas. The dollar is a holding currency. Like tons of reasons we should care directly. Um, and not least of which is morally. Um, but let me also say that indirectly, if we want help for solving the problems we are worried about in the world, whether those problems are climate change or terrorism, we actually need other capable governments that have the bandwidth to care about the problems we care about. And I'll close by telling you that when I, the biggest surprise to me when I was working in the White House after um, the September 11th attacks is that the United States does what we always do, right? We go stampeding into everybody's country and say, we've got a problem and you need to put aside whatever you're doing and deal with this. And I'll just take the, the case of the government of South Africa. Um, one, of their, uh, one of their government staff said to me, we wish we had the problems you had, right? South Africa was enduring a very difficult transition to genuine democracy, dealing with the, the change from minority rule to majority rule in that country and all of the difficult uh, transitions that go with that and an HIV crisis that was creating tumult, not only creating huge per individual human tragedy, but orphaning people and upturning the labor force. The September 11th attack, they would have happily taken our problems and given us their problems. So, so let me close by saying that Americans actually have a very easy set of problems in the world, although it doesn't often seem like that to us. Um, and I would just encourage you as you think about whether we should be involved in solving other people's problems to try and put yourself in the circumstances of the people experiencing them. If you haven't yet read Fred Hyatt's uh, op-ed piece in today's Washington Post uh, about Syria, I encourage it and I hope it will speak to your willingness to care about and do something about other people's problems. I'm done now. Thank you very much. Very, um, very interesting. Just sit and listen to your train of thought.
Um, the floor is open for questions. By which he is saying, I think, I did inadequate preparation for this talk. <laughs> Does anyone have objections, questions, subjects I didn't cover that you're curious about? Yes, ma'am. Will you please introduce yourself to me and tell me either what you are studying or what you do? And let me also give you the microphone. Oh. Although you don't need it for the room, we need it for the recording. Okay, got it. Oh, and I think okay. it may be okay. turned it off again. Thank you. Um, so I've been hearing about this in the news a lot. Um, do you think that climate change has like um, an influence on like global terrorism? And oh, my name's Michelle Shen. Um, I'm still in high school. Uh, I'm, I got admitted, so I'm kind of... Congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! For the incoming Berkeley freshman. So I don't. I don't see a connection between climate change and terrorism um, uh, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, terrorism is... Uh, has lots of lots of causes, lots of immediate pressing causes. My own view is that the terrorism recruitment conveyor belt is actually very much like the gang recruitment conveyor belt. People who aren't webbed tightly into families and communities and feel disaffected from the society that they are that they are living in is one strand of what feeds terrorism. A second is a belief that change isn't possible. And this is actually why the failure of the Arab Spring is so worrisome, right? Because the Al-Qaeda narrative is you can't create political change. Violence is your only path. And if I were a young Egyptian, that would probably look pretty persuasive to me right now. A third strand of terrorism um, is radicalization, right? Is some charismatic figure getting their hands on you and persuading you that this is going to, this is going to make you a man. This is going to make you belong. This is going to make you beloved of God. This, whatever key in the lock turns, um, I think those are much more immediate drivers. Um, climate change is a big problem. It's going to drive lots of differences. Not only is it going to drive a lot of island nations underwater um, and drive American agriculture into Canada, um, it's going to create a huge tumultuous amount of change on time unless we get our hands around this problem. But I don't think terrorism uh, connects very much to it. My name is Bill Lau. I'm a retiree and a Stanford alum, and I love to come to all of these lectures here. Uh, We're ask for next time. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of look at foreign policy as being the result of the, the political leadership, the career diplomats, the military, and perhaps the business community through their lobbyists. Uh, can you tell me, based on your experience, if the balance has changed between the Bush administration and the current administration? Um, do you mean in the internal policy making or in the choices? In the policy making and the execution of the policy. Sure. The um, sure, it's a great question. So it has always been a mystery to me why a country that we, well, it's not a mystery. We are. A, a government founded by people who distrust concentration of power, right? And so the American government doesn't work seamlessly, right? Like people always want to have a foreign policy that's crisp and efficient and all the government agencies work well together. And we are not a people that created that kind of government and don't actually much want it now. So you get fractured policymaking is one thing because of the kind of government we have. One, one more thing on the kind of government we have. Uh, a brisk, efficient, everybody pulling the same way government um, would, wouldn't ha would deal with leaks in a very different way than the American government does, which is mostly leaks keep our government honest 
and they're an integral part of the policy formation process because if you think your government's about to make a bad choice, you're going to tell the New York Times uh, reporter who's going to write an article about it, and Congress and people like me are going to start baying about, wait a minute, wait a minute, we need to consider the, right? Usually that's what happens in the American system. It's sort of, uh, Shockey's theory of authoritarianism <coughs> is that the country, so the international order is changing in ways that are democratizing. Right? The cost of capital is at, at historically incredibly low levels. Right, So you can get money to start businesses, um, information. Governments try to control it, and it's getting easier and easier not to. The cooperation that you see on Twitter and all of the social media tools. Right, There's a fundamental democratization going on in the international order. And that is great good news for free people and free governments. It's very bad news for authoritarian governments. Um, so the good news is the big sloppy mess of American foreign policy is, is actually the wave of the future. And we're probably not going to get any better at it than we are. To the sharp edge of your question, though, which is, uh, yes, the Bush administration was more willing to use military force than the Obama administration is. It was also more willing than the Obama administration to use economic sanctions, to use the incentive of membership in organizations like NATO, to use free trade agreements as ways to bind countries together. President Obama, to his great credit, in his second term, allowed himself to be persuaded that a trans-Pacific trade partnership that locked together most of the countries of the, the Pacific Rim, um, right? Because that's not where he was in 2008. Um, and it's the only big change of direction that he made in his foreign policy. Um, that's been a routine tool of American presidents beforehand. Um, and the president deserves a lot of credit, and the Republicans who will pass it in Congress deserve a lot of credit for standing up for free trade when people haven't been defending why it's in our interests. Um, so, so the Obama administration, as a general rule, has been, weirdly enough, less engaged. Um, less, I, I am shocked at, uh, to have Western Europeans tell me that they're homesick for the Bush administration that they hated because at least we cared enough about their problems to want to engage on them. Um, so, so I do think there's more of a general reticence. It's not that they have rebalanced diplomacy over military force. It's that they have uh, moved back on most fronts. Hi, my name is Austin Tutman. I'm also a newly admitted student. And Congratulations. Uh, and my question for you is, um, you spent a lot of time talking about the Middle East and the foreign policy in the Middle East, but do you think more attention should be given to Sub-Saharan Africa, both in terms of the success of French and Mali and the troubles in Nigeria with Boko Haram? OK, that's a fantastic question, a high level, um, serious thinking about the world and putting pieces together question. So bravo. Um, do I think we should spend, yes, I do think we should spend more time and effort on sub-Saharan Africa than we have. The Bush administration is bad at most things, was actually great at Africa policy. Um, the PEPFAR program, the, the assiduous work with the Gates Foundations and other NGOs to help build strength and resilience in African healthcare systems, medical systems. Um, was a huge and a wonderful thing. Celebrating peaceful transitions of government in those countries. But most of the democratic governments in sub-Saharan Africa have now been in power, I mean, same leader has now been in power, what, 20 years? Four? There are at least four where authoritarians have figured out how to use the the trappings of free societies to ensure their continued power. And we haven't paid enough attention to that, we should. Also, you know, the mindset of Africa as a place of, of disease and poverty 
is 20 years out of date, um, at, as you suggest, in ways both good and bad. So the bad way, the spread of terrorism, the French did a terrific job in Mali, and, and we are doing a lot throughout the region as well to try and help local forces get a handle on it. But it's, a hard, it's hard going, and it's hard to get the balance right so that you give them the kind of assistance to help keep terrorism at bay without giving them the assistance to become military dictatorships. Um, it's a very, it's hard to get that one right. But lastly, the entrepreneurialism, the, right, like cell phone banking doesn't start here, it starts in Africa. And there are so many exciting, it's a renaissance of literature, like there's just lots that's lovely going on and we're not paying nearly the attention we should. So yes, you're right. Any other questions? Yes, my name is James Shin. I'm a retired State Department Foreign Service officer. And I've been around a long time, so I've seen a lot of different administrations come and go. And the issue of American leadership and responsibility, I, I would take, I think, minor issue with one thing that you said. Eisenhower in 51 made that statement largely for political reasons to get the Congress on board. I don't think I had any illusions after World War II and his inability to get other countries to come along and contribute in the way he thought they should, that he had any illusions probably about what was going to take place in the future. I think that if you, if you go back and look at the long sweep of history since I joined the Foreign Service 50 years ago, our engagement internationally today is probably the least that I have seen in my lifetime. Wow, really? Yeah, I, I think, huh. in the, and the argument that, uh, that we're carrying too great a burden, throughout my career I heard the same arguments that we're spending too much on NATO, they're not contributing enough, et cetera, et cetera. And I give you just one example. Uh, in the 1980s, I served on the edge of Yugoslavia in the, the consulate in Trieste. And in 1990, when Balkan irredentism broke out again, right. the Bush senior administration endeavored to lead from behind. Right. What George Bush said at that time was, let the Europeans solve this. It's their problem. It's not our problem. I do recall the Secretary of State, James Baker, saying, we don't have a dog in this we fight. We don't have a dog in this fight. At the time, I said, that is a disaster, because right. the Europeans and will never coalesce to resist Milosevic at that time without strong and forceful American leadership. Right. When President Clinton mistakenly bombed the Chinese embassy, in Belgrade, a, a message was sent and received, and from then, basically, the Clinton administration got the thing back on track. But my, my concluding point is, we are less engaged now than we have been in my lifetime. And we have to get, the, the responsibility of leadership is that you have to pay a much greater price than the followers, because in part, you have the flexibility to do things that they can't do. So we're never going to get to the situation where others contribute the way we think that they should. And I think when we carry forward that idea, it, it lays the basis for a real misunderstanding about the way world leadership works. <coughs> what percent, I, I basically agree with you, but let me ask you a data question. What percentage of NATO defense spending do you think the United States should what should our budget be as a proportion, right? 28 NATO states, uh, a lot of strong, prosperous. How, how much of the overall spending should we account for? We're probably spending close to 70%. And, and, I, and, I, would right. that, and I would say that, and that's 3.5% of our GDP on, on the military. That's the lowest percent, if you go back 20, 30, 40, 50 I agree years, with you. I agree with you that the United States doesn't can. spend what we used to, right. but it is also true that everyone else spends less. And I'm quite sympathetic to the argument that if Germany wants to spend its money on ways other than defense, the consequence is that we are going to be less committed to fighting at the very you know, to getting troops there as quick as possible, as opposed to reinforce them uh, after trouble occurs. I, I, yeah. The United States defense spending is almost 75 percent 
of it's like that. Right? It, I'm sorry. Three four percent. It's about three point five percent of GDP. Only four NATO countries spend more than two percent of their GDP. I know it, but I thought his question was how much, what fraction of NATO do we pay for? Did you say So you mean? Okay, so so in in NATO, there's a fairly small organizational budget that pays for the headquarters, it pays for NATO AWACS, it pays for some exercises. We pay 25% of that budget. That's what we thought our fair share was when it was set up. It hasn't been changed. So the difference between that and the 75% of defense spending, um, I, I do think, is but, relevant. Again, but I think you're also saying that, which I, it's all getting, is that if NATO decides to an action, we will end up paying, you know, some larger fraction than 25 percent in delivering what I would Yes, cost. because when, when NATO actually fights, yeah. right, as we are yeah. in Afghanistan, the NATO budget doesn't pay for it. Countries pay for their own contribution. So the NATO allies, to their credit, have been with us in Afghanistan since 2001, and that's a beautiful thing. They are a third of the force there. So two thirds of the troops and two thirds of the force are us. So what is the conflict? Again, I guess I don't quite understand the aircraft. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, I mean, yes, in far as far as the world order goes, perhaps you know, we spend a good fraction of the three and a half percent of our GDP, and we have helping everybody in the world you know, to stand whatever, do whatever needs to be done. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it seems to me that's a little different than not paying our fair share of Okay, yeah, that sounds reasonable to me. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Sean Anulon. I'm running uh, centenary of the uh, Irish 1916 Rising here in April 22nd, 24th, starting the Women's Faculty Club. But um, you did ask for points of view that, that actually yes, disagreed with yours. Yeah. So, so um, the, the first, first point is, um, with respect to the United States solving problems throughout the world, arguably it's also created a lot of problems recently. And arguably, uh, what we're seeing in Europe, these, um, the uh, attacks are due to basically this eschatological, apocalyptic uh, thread in Islamic thought being amplified by what happened in Abu Ghraib and, and others. And that was going to constitute my question until you came up with what, what really is the phrase that, that is going to uh, remain with me from this talk, which is what you described. I think the phrase you used was the big sloppy mess of um, American foreign policy, which, which you don't think is going to get any better. And, and that, that is actually um, uh, pro problematic. Um, so, uh, for example, if, if we take the Obama versus the George W. Bush uh, administrations, um, the George W. Bush administration uh, arguably got us into an illegal war. This is the, the West, and this has actually destabilized Europe um, for probably the, the, the rest of our lifetimes. Now, this is my, my uh, question would come down to this at this point, since things have moved on. What United States, which I've been uh, a very... Uh, grateful guest of for, for a decade here. What the United States looks like at this point is you've got the legislative, executive, judicial wings of government. Then you've all these secret wings of government, a lot of which really only came into existence on the basis of models supplied by the British during the Second World War, things like the CIA, or one that very few of you have heard of, for example, diplomatic security services. Um, could you actually see from our point of view, the United States does not seem to be in control. Um, there doesn't seem to be accountability. There doesn't seem to be government by the people. And that, you know, it currently looks like a good place to disengage from if you are a country that's in a position to do that. Interesting. Um, what countries do you believe are doing that? Are, are, disengaging. are disengaging from the United States? Um, Sorry, I, I think we want to get the thing, thing, uh, thing on record. Well, one of the, I run a society called the International Congress of Irish Studies, and, and one of our major platforms is to first start cut these uh, tax scams, which are basically, in our view, disgracing us, the 
Apple scam and so on. Apple so is, is an Irish Ireland one of the countries I, I, you are suggesting I would, is disengaging I, from the United States? I would, States? well, Ireland doesn't have a government at the moment. And um, the, I'm not sure if you've been following Irish politics. And, and what we're re really, really um, pushing for is, in fact, yeah, th precisely this type of disengagement and precisely, for example, the... Uh, so one of the interesting things about uh, American prominence in the international order is that I agree with you. We very often make mistakes. We very often make problems worse. Um, we very often uh, go stomping into a place where we don't know what we're doing. All of those things are true, which is, what, which is the reason I asked for your list of countries that are disengaging from the United States, because actually the list should be a lot bigger than it is. And so one of the curiosities about American about the sustainability of American power is that, first of all, um, we are so fortunate that, that our values, even when we fail them, as in cases like Abu Ghraib, our values carry enough weight that very often people give us the benefit of the doubt because they think we're trying to do the right thing. Se let me finish. Sure. Second. Um, point about it is that it's really also um, a relative, not an absolute g game, right? Because would you want China to set the rules of the international order? Probably not. And so would you want Russia to set the rules of the international order? Probably not. So the United States benefits very often over long stretches of time because the alternatives are worse. And I think that's actually where we are right now. The alternatives are worse. I do want to be fair to all the other yeah. questions, and we will have a chance afterwards for you to pursue specific points with Very quickly, these, these aren't countries anymore. Uh, I could mention Iraq, I could mention Syria, Libya, but they're not actually countries anymore as a result of the utopia of American. And yet, nation. both Libya and Iraq are asking for more help from us. I'm just saying, yeah. <laughs> like, they should be making different choices. They're not. Please. I'll take a couple more questions. The more questions we have, terrific, but it's less time for us to enjoy a glass of wine. And <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take a couple more questions, and then we'll call it off. So right here. Hi. Thank you for coming to Berkeley. My name is Sophie Marie Kong, and I'm a junior in history here. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, my question is: will be at the international level of analysis um, for the 21st century. I have uh, a little bit, with respectfully to you, a different critique on your assumption that uh, U.S. will continue to be a benign hegemon. Because the preponderance of power and the distribution answer. of power in the structure of international politics is different now. Uh, because mm -hmm. after World War II, U.S. became the prominent hegemon because the rest of the other will suffer from war. Mm -hmm. Like Russia has 27 million dead, and England and Germany and sure. France. Okay. So, but now the situation is different. 21st century, I don't say that the U.S. in decline, but other country rising in the factor right. of power. So I felt that thus far, because of lack of preponderance, like in the second, like in the post-war, Second World War, so the U.S. tried to maintain the hegemon in in the fashion of leading behind because of lack of sufficient financial and capability in other area. So I felt that why can't we go on on the UN Perm 5? Because, for example, Syria, if you talk with Russia, you wouldn't have all this mess of refugee and so many oh, stuff. Yes, we would. Yeah, I mean, like, so because each other great powers have their own national interests, U.S. cannot rule the world as in the past, tw in the 20th century. So I felt this is what my disagreement with you on the assumption. It's a great question. So uh, the question is, uh, can the United, does the United States need to find different ways of trying to shape the world because our, dominant, our relative dominance is diminished? And I think that's certainly true. 
But there's a really interesting political science test going on in the international order right now. And China and Russia are the test cases. And the, the political science question is, is it possible to become a prosperous society without being democratic? So the rise of China has been a magnificent story, right? Hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. And the Chinese government's model, it looks to me, is to try and persuade people that prosperity ought to be enough. They shouldn't demand a representative government. And that the Chinese can find ways to make government accountable without free press and without elections. And there aren't prior examples of that. And so it will be very interesting to see whether it's whether the people of China, as they begin to take their economic well-being for granted, whether they don't want a government that they can hold more closely accountable than they can now. And I think it's an open question. I don't know the answer to it. Um, but but it's going to it's an exciting time. Two more questions and then we'll break. Hi, my name is Kirsten. Um, I'm a senior um, here. And um, I just have a question. America started the chain of building nuclear weapons. And now after America, Russia starts build rep um, building weapons. And now many countries, especially um, countries that are threatening, have nuclear weapons. Um, I learned in class that um, more nuclear weapons does not mean that countries will bomb each other, thankfully. <laughs> but um, right. so my question is, what should America do with this? Um, America started the, the dom this domino fall. Now there is a security dilemma. Do you think we should have the we should take responsibility? Um, and since America is in this entrenchment era, what should America uh, do, do? And what is the wise thing you think um, America should do? Thank you. It's a wonderful question. And I'm really glad you are studying um, nuclear deterrence and the ethics of, of being a nuclear weapon state. I think it's really important. It has somewhat fallen out of fashion in, uh, recently, but it's about to become fashionable again for exactly the reason you mentioned, which is lots of countries we are frightened of their behavior are close to the th proliferation threshold, or like North Korea, already passed it. Um, I don't agree with one premise of your question, which is that we have not taken responsibility. I think the United States has actually been an incredibly responsible nuclear power in not proliferating our own weapons in creating transparency in the system. The nuclear suppliers group, for example, our export control laws, in which we are very carefully accounting for our weapons, for our material, and being model citizens and encouraging cooperation in that regard. I also think the Obama administration has been working the Iranian nuclear issue incredibly hard. I personally would have preferred it wasn't the only thing that they worked on on U.S.-Iranian relations. But this is a country at the threshold, which we now will have a lot more confidence. We understand the choices that they're making in their nuclear weapons program. And that will be stabilizing across time. The, um, the other thing, though, is that uh, you know, the democratization that I was talking about includes democratization of access to technology and material. And, um, and that's going to make, it's going to make international security very brittle going forward unless we can find other better ways of cooperation than we have so far. So I hope you will spend time and effort. I'm sorry, one last thing I should have said about us as a responsible power is that we also, um, in agreements with our adversaries, as well as agreements with our friends, have dramatically reduced our nuclear weapons stockpiles and ensured their safety. 
Um, and so I actually think our record's pretty good on this, but I think you ought to do a lot of work on how to make it better. Come up with new ways to do this. We are going to need them. And they require people who have strategic judgment, technical expertise, and a good humanities education, which is clear from your question you are getting. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. My name is Myra Lurch. I'm an alumna of Berkeley, as is my husband, and we're both Peace Corps volunteers returning. Yay! Um, and I, I have a I appreciate your background, especially in academics and, and how it relates to foreign policy. Um, I'm interested, I have a little bit of background in the PNAC doctrine, and I'm interested to hear your opinion of how that was written and the ramifications for U.S. policy. I'm sorry, the what doctrine? The PNAC doctrine. Tell me what that is. It's the doctrine created by, was it Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz? I'm, it's... It has to do with justifying entry overseas when people pose a threat to us. What's it stand for? P-I-N-A-C. Policy for International... The New American Century. Yeah. New American, New American, New American Century. Century. Oh, good Lord. It's a, so, it's, I'm, so I'm glad I know nothing it's of what it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what, it's what my political science uncle in Canada points to as the reason we went into Iraq. Um, I don't know. Is anyone okay. else... Yeah, I um, it was, it was a, sorry. Yeah. It was a a paper written in the '90s by generally what we we call neoconservative. Oh, 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 wait a minute. Proposal for a uh, okay. For a I've new, got new the American trail now. Century. Okay, so when okay, Zama Khalilzad and Paul Wolfowitz were people, in the first Bush administration. Yes. They were in the policy planning cell in the Pentagon, and they wrote this paper about preserving American dominance in the order. No, I think, Thank I, you. I think that this actually was written during the Clinton administration, and it did talk about regime change in Iraq, Iran, and if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, in China as well. Yeah. So... Um, I can, see Neil, I can see Neil getting nervous, so uh, we, we'll talk about this over drinks, but let me just say two things. The first is that um, a lot of stupid stuff goes on in the American government, and, and this is Exhibit A. Um, I don't believe it was influential as a doctrine for American strategy. My own sense, working in the defense shop in the White House, uh, from 2002 forward. The thing that surprised me most was how fearful everybody was. That they really felt that September 11th was possibly the first of many attacks on the United States. And the mindset of the people deciding whether to go into Iraq was that this was a guy who had um, who had invaded neighboring countries, who'd fought a brutal eight-year war with Iran in which he had used chemical weapons on his adversaries, um, who had used chemical weapons on his own people, and who was screwing around with UN investigators in a way that made them and us very nervous. There was a clandestine nuclear program. And my recollection of the attitudes of all of the senior people who supported the war in Iraq was they were so fearful to go back to the American people and say, we knew this guy was a problem. We've had continuous military operations going on in his country for 15 years. He's, right, like all of these things, we could have done more and we didn't. That's the long shadow of the September 11th attacks. I think if the problems with the UN inspections in Iraq had occurred even five years later, I don't think the Bush administration would have in, in, intervened in Iraq as they did in 2003. It, it looked to me not as the sweeping arrogance of rewriting the rules of order so much as fear. Um. Corey, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs>